The go-to advice on pretty much any online finance forum ever seems to be just invest in the S&P 500, bro. As it's bandied about so often, even people who don't understand what investing in the S&P 500 actually entails still parrot it as if it's the golden rule of investing and anyone doing something else is a moron. What if I told you there's some issues with simply investing in the S&P 500 that you probably weren't aware of and following generic advice you find from overly confident people online might not actually suit your goals. In this video we will look at what exactly investing in the S&P 500 is, why it's the common go-to advice, what the downsides are and what people might be missing. Finally, as it's asked so often, I'll also compare investing in the almost daily dividend portfolio with the S&P 500 and which might suit your goals better. Hello and welcome back to the Dividend Experiment, the channel that helps you build a portfolio that pays your bills. The content that will be discussed is intended for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice or investment recommendation. Firstly, what is the S&P 500 and how do you even invest in it? The S&P 500 or Standard & Poor's 500 is a market capitalization weighted index that consists of 500 of the largest publicly traded companies in the United States. So S&P is short for Standard & Poor's, which is a rating agency, and 500 just means the 500 companies. These companies span various sectors of the economy including technology, healthcare, finance, consumer goods and industrials. The selection process for inclusion in the S&P 500 is rigorous and conducted by the S&P Dow Jones Indices, a division of S&P Global. Factors considered include market capitalization, which is the total value of the company's outstanding shares, liquidity, or how easily shares of a company can be bought or sold, and industry representation. Companies must meet specific criteria to be eligible, such as being based in the US, having minimum market capitalization, and having positive earnings for the most recent four quarters. The index is weighted by market capitalization, meaning that companies with higher market values have a greater impact on the index's performance. This ensures that larger companies influence the index more than smaller ones. The performance of the S&P 500 is closely watched by investors, economists, policymakers and analysts because it provides insights into the overall health of the US stock market and to the economy too. When the index rises, it suggests the value of the collective stocks of the included companies is increasing, reflecting positive sentiment and economic growth. Conversely, a decline in the index may indicate economic uncertainty or downturn. Basically, a lot of the time when people say the market is doing this or the market is doing such and such, they actually mean the US stock market specifically and the S&P 500 as a representation of that. Additionally, the S&P 500 serves as a benchmark for evaluating the performance of investment portfolios and individual stocks. Investors will often compare their portfolio returns to the returns of the S&P 500 to assess how well their investments are doing relative to the broader market. Overall, the S&P 500 plays a significant role in financial markets and serves as a key indicator of the state of the US economy. In other words, it's a pretty big deal when it comes to investing. But how do you invest in it? Basically, you need to find a fund provider and an investment app or brokerage. Let me explain how to do both. One common way to invest in the S&P 500 is through index funds or exchange traded funds, ETFs, that track the performance of the index. These funds pool the money from multiple investors to buy shares of the companies included in the S&P 500 in proportions that mimic the index's composition. Investors can buy shares of these funds through brokerage accounts, retirement accounts or investment platforms. Index funds typically offer low expense ratios making them a cost effective way to gain exposure to the S&P 500. Here's some examples. These two are from Vanguard which is one of the most well known and trusted investment management companies in the world. The tickers here are VUSA and VUAG. The differences are that VUSA pays out a dividend and VUAG reinvests it for you, so it's a personal choice of preference. But these are just two examples of funds that people can use to invest in the S&P 500. You might be able to find ones that are better or cheaper, but we don't really have the scope to go into that in this video. So now we have the fund, we also need the investment app. And if you've followed the channel for a while, you know that I recommend Trading212 as the best option for the majority of use cases and users, and in this video it's going to be no different. On top of that, I asked Trading212 if they could give me a unique code that you guys can simply type into the promo code section, capital at risk. So if you've opened up a new account recently or are planning to open an account, then here it is, DIVXP or D-I-V-E-X-P, short for Dividend Experiment. So you have 10 days from opening your account to type this in and receive shares worth up to £100. 
I also get something as this is my custom code, so this helps you support the channel too. And if you do use it, thank you for your support, and thanks to Trading212 for sponsoring this video. So now we have a fund and a way to buy it, but it leaves the bigger question, should we just buy the S&P 500? So imagine you have some money and you want to invest it to make more money over time. One popular way people do this is by investing in the S&P 500. Here's why people often suggest investing in the S&P 500. Spreading the risk. Investing in the S&P 500 offers diversification across a wide array of companies spanning various industries including technology, healthcare and finance. Each company operates independently, so the success or failure of one isn't directly tied to the others. This diversification helps reduce risk by spreading your investment across multiple sectors, shielding you from the potential negative impact of poor performance in any single company. Moreover, because your investment is spread across 500 companies, the impact of individual company performance is minimised. Even if one company, such as, let's call it company A, performs poorly, the gains from other companies that are thriving can help offset those losses. Essentially, you're not reliant on the success of any single company to make money, providing a more stable investment approach. This risk management strategy, combined with a historical long-term growth trend mirroring the overall US economy, positions investors to benefit from potential growth, while mitigating the risk associated with individual companies' fluctuations. Reason 2. Good history. The S&P 500 has a history of doing well for investors. On average, it's gone up by about 10% each year. This means that if you put your money into the S&P 500, it has a good chance of growing by around 10% every year on average, though of course past results are not an indication of future returns. This success is tied to how the US economy grows over time. When the economy does well, companies make more money, and their stock prices usually go up. The S&P 500 reflects this growth, making it a solid choice for long-term investors. Plus, even though the stock market can be bumpy in the short term, sticking with the S&P 500 for the long haul often pays off. This is because your investment can keep growing over time, thanks to something called compounding returns. So by staying patient and sticking with it, you can benefit from the market's tendency to bounce back and bring in positive results. Reason 3. You pay less in fees. Investing in the S&P 500 it typically entails lower fees compared to other investment options for a few key reasons. Firstly, index funds and ETFs that track the S&P 500 operate on a passive management strategy, meaning they aim to replicate the index's composition rather than actively pick and choose stocks, and therefore paying trading fees. This passive approach reduces the need for costly fund managers and extensive research, resulting in lower fees for investors. Additionally, the popularity of these funds among investors allows them to benefit from economies of scale, spreading fixed costs across a larger pool of assets and further driving down fees. Since the index's composition doesn't change frequently, these funds don't need to make frequent adjustments to their holdings, reducing transaction costs. And reason four, it's easy to do. Investing in the S&P 500 is not only accessible, but also straightforward for investors of all backgrounds. You don't need to be a financial expert to get started. Through specialised investment funds known as index funds, which are readily available through banks and investment companies, investors can easily gain exposure to the S&P 500. Investing in the S&P 500 follows a passive strategy where investors essentially go along with the broader market rather than trying to outsmart it. This approach eliminates the stress and complexity associated with picking individual stocks, and trying to time the market. Instead, investors can simply trust in the long-term growth potential of the US economy, and studies have shown that passive investing strategies such as investing in the S&P 500 often yield favourable results over the long term. By embracing a hands-off approach and letting the market do its work, investors can benefit from the market's overall upward trajectory, while avoiding the pitfalls of active trading. So these are some pretty compelling reasons to invest in the S&P 500, and to be clear, I don't think simply choosing to invest in one fund that tracks the S&P 500 is a bad idea for many people. However, there are downsides that are never really discussed when people give the advice that it's the only way to invest. Lack of diversification. Now, I know what you're thinking. I just said the S&P 500 was diverse. How can it be a downside too? While the S&P 500 provides exposure to a wide range of companies across different sectors, it's still heavily focused on the US market. By investing solely in the S&P 500, you may miss out on opportunities for diversification across other regions and asset classes, such as international stocks or bonds or real estate and commodities. And diversifying your portfolio can help reduce risk and improve returns over the long term. Sector concentration risk. 
The composition of the S&P 500 is not static and can be heavily influenced by the performance of certain sectors at different times. For example, technology stocks have had a significant weight in recent years. If a particular sector experiences a downturn, it can have a disproportionate impact on the overall performance of the index and your investment returns. Overvaluation concerns. At certain times, the S&P 500 may be considered overvalued based on metrics like price to earning ratios or historical trends. Investing in an overvalued market could potentially lead to lower returns or even losses if stock prices revert to more reasonable levels. And finally, limited exposure to small cap and mid cap stocks. While the S&P 500 includes 500 of the largest US companies, it therefore excludes smaller companies known as small cap and mid cap stocks. These companies may offer higher growth potential compared to their larger counterparts, but they're not represented by the index. By investing solely in the S&P 500, you miss out on the potential benefits of these smaller companies. So what's an alternative? Nick Majuli, on his blog of Dollars and Data, has a great post on this topic. Should your portfolio be 100% US stocks? He writes, after looking at this plot, you might argue there's no point in owning international stocks because they simply haven't performed as well as US stocks in the past. And while this is technically true, a lot of the argument hinges on data from the most recent decade. When we control for this recency bias, US stocks don't look quite as impressive. For example, if we run this exact same analysis back in 2013, which would have excluded the last 10 years, US stocks would have only outperformed international stocks in 41% of all rolling 10-year periods. As you can see in this plot, from 1970 to 2013, US stocks were more likely to underperform than outperform international stocks over a random 10-year window. It's because of this recency bias that telling people they should only invest in US stocks sounds like smart, solid advice, but who knows what the future holds and whether the US will outperform going forward too. One alternative is to invest in an all-world fund. An all-world fund ETF, also known as a global equity fund ETF or a total world ETF, is an exchange-traded fund that invests in stocks from companies all around the world across various countries and regions. These ETFs aim to provide investors with broad exposure to the global equity market in a single investment vehicle. The composition of an all-world fund ETF typically includes stocks from both developed and emerging markets, covering a wide range of industries and sectors. By investing in such an ETF, investors can gain exposure to thousands of companies worldwide, diversifying their portfolio and potentially reducing risk. All world ETFs are designed to track the performance of specific global equity index such as the MSCI, All Country World Index or the FTSE All World Index. These indexes represent the overall global equity market and include stocks from both developed and emerging economies. You can find these types of funds on Trading212 and maybe I'll make another video on different types of these and what they all mean if you want. Finally, as I said at the beginning of the video, I'll compare the almost daily dividends pie to the S&P 500. Now this is a very common question on the pie, should you just invest in the S&P 500 instead of the almost daily dividends pie? Now at first, these two types of investments aren't really comparable in my opinion, so it's strange to me to consider them as a versus. But if we look back at those four points I mentioned earlier about why the S&P 500 is touted as a good investment strategy, we can see if they apply to the almost daily dividend pie too. So first was spreading the risk. The S&P 500 has, well, 500 stocks in it, whereas the almost daily dividend pie has 50. That's 10 times less, so S&P 500 clearly wins here in terms of number of holdings. However, if you watched this video I made recently, you only really need about 20 to 30 stocks to diversify away the market risk, so we can argue it's relatively even there. Second reason was good history. I made the almost daily dividends pie in September 2020, so in terms of length of history, the S&P 500 obviously wins. However, we can use the feature on trading 2 on 2 pies to check the returns of the past 5 years. It's called the AAR. So if we look at the S&P AAR in the last 5 years, while not forgetting that post from Nick Majuli we looked at earlier about recency bias, we can see that it's 14.68%. Then looking at the almost daily dividend portfolio, we can see it is lower at 11.33%. Ok, next one pay less in fees. Buying the S&P is very cheap, however it does come with the ongoing fee depending on which fund provider you go with. Usually these are very very small like 0.07% but there is a fee. The fee you have to pay on the almost daily dividend pie is slightly different in structure, there's no ongoing fee so no fee to hold on to it, but you do pay a foreign currency fee of 0.15% from trading 2 and 2 
if you buy or invest in this pie. So pretty cheap too, really. Easy to do. Both are super easy to do thanks to the pie feature. You can invest in either with a few clicks thanks to trading two on two pies. The only difference really is the almost daily dividend pie is best when you sign up for the email list to get updates about the pie and any changes I make to it. My thoughts. Fairly comparable offering, but here are my thoughts on the two options. If you literally don't care about dividends or don't care about dividend frequency, then just go for the S&P 500. That's the main offering and purpose of the pie. If you do want income, then the pie is obviously better. The S&P 500 will likely outperform during the good times or bull markets. However, it will also drop more than the almost daily dividends pie during down times or bear markets. My other thought is that you don't necessarily need to do an either or. It's perfectly reasonable to have both, and you can see how I structure this and my entire philosophy on investing in my video called The Metronome. If you liked this video, and if you made it this far, I'm guessing you probably did, then I have some good news for you. I'm giving away my PDF guide to the 10 dividend investing commandments, or the criteria that I use to pick dividend paying stocks, and I'm giving it away to you for free. All you need to do is submit your email in the link below and it'll get delivered to your inbox straight away. Again, that's for free. But that's not the only benefit of joining the email. You also get updates on the almost daily dividend portfolio, interesting stock ideas or news, and special deals and free stuff that I can share with you. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you on the next video. See you!